And we're back. Okay. Starting with all the Watergate stuff. So part two of all the Nixon stuff is Watergate to the end of his presidency. So Watergate is named after a hotel and convention complex in Washington, D.C. In that complex, the Democratic National Committee, the DNC, the Democratic Party, had their headquarters for the 1972 election. Right? So that was there. So that's the background. All right. Nixon helped, or Nixon's campaign formed a group called the Committee to Reelect the President, which was an awful name because uh, it's known now as CREEP, right? If you do the letters, it becomes CREEP, the acronym. Um, so, anyways, it's formed to help Nixon win the 1972 election. June 17th of 1972, so that is uh, five months or so, six, four months before the election, five months before the election. Five men are arrested for breaking into the Democratic Party National Headquarters in that Watergate hotel complex in D.C. All five of these men worked for CREEP, for the Committee to Re-elect the President. Investigative reporters named uh, Woodward and Bernstein, who were both worked for the Washington Post, kept investigating and writing stories about the break-in. They had a source, right? Um, the source uh, went by the code name Deep Throat. Uh, and they had this source, and they kept writing and kept writing and kept writing. A lot of the story kind of get, gets forgotten, right? Uh, Watergate is known as a huge, 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 huge scandal, but at the time, it was kind of just a deal. It happened. The country moved on a little bit, but because of the persistence of Woodward and Bernstein and some other reporters, the story stayed alive and stayed alive and stayed alive, and thank goodness it did because it revealed some of the worst presidential corruption we've ever had. So, of those five workers, two of them had a direct link to the White House. They okay, also had White House access. So it seems pretty obvious that Nixon has something to do with this. So this picture here, that's the Watergate complex right there. It's still around, it's still used, right? Here are some of the reporters on the left. That's what Woodward and Bernstein actually look like. On the right, they made a movie about it, right, called All the President's Men. Uh, starting, starving, starving. St uh, starring some actors um, um, that look a lot different. So they are there on the right and in the middle. So which president was involved in the Watergate scandal? Was it A, Nixon, B, Carter, C, Ford, or D, Reagan? All right, so the cover-up. Ever, ever heard the saying, maybe you've heard the saying that the uh, cover-up is worse than the crime? Uh, this is probably... An instance of that, although the crime wasn't great either. So, Creep and Nixon both deny any involvement. They say it's a vast conspiracy to try to make the president look bad. Nixon probably didn't order the burglary. Okay, uh, We don't have any evidence that he directly did. He probably knew about it, but he definitely ordered the cover-up. Okay, Absolutely. He destroyed, uh, ordered them to destroy evidence. He ordered hush money to be paid. There's tapes of him ordering or talking about how much money he could pay these guys if they don't say a word. Uh, when that looks like it might not be enough, Nixon decides to go uh, above and beyond, and he orders the CIA to interfere with the FBI. So he says, hey, Central Intelligence Agency, you need to stop the FBI from investigating, and they will try. 1973, the burglars are sent to jail, and a formal investigation begins. This will be led by Sam Irvin of North Carolina and Archibald Cox, who was set as the special prosecutor. So on the left is Irvin, on the right is Cox. Uh, Irvin himself, not particular. he was, um, he might have been a Democrat, but he was, a, was quite a conservative guy, so he was on par, like he agreed with a lot of Nixon policy, so it wasn't like some partisan witch hunt or anything like that. May of 73, like I said, the hearings begin. The alleged crimes here against the president were illegal campaign financing, which was uh, much to do with he was taking campaign funds to bribe these guys to stay quiet. Political espionage, so spying on your political opponents. And the illegal use of the IRS to harass political enemies. Nixon was probably doing all right, stonewalling everything and stopping anything from making uh, real problems for him until a guy by the name of John Dean testifies. John Dean was a lawyer for the Nixon White House, for the Nixon campaign. And he testifies that Nixon was directly involved in um, this cover-up, and he offered to uh, give clemency or to pardon others who took blame uh, and all sorts of things to keep himself in power. He also um, 
reveals one of the most crazy um, bombshell deals uh, in American political history. He announced that Nixon was secretly recording everybody in the Oval Office. That he had a bunch of different tape recorders around the Oval Office and he recorded everything without telling anybody. Nixon gets subpoenaed to give over the tapes, so he gets ordered by a court to give up the tapes. He refuses. He says, I have executive privilege. That is a broad power we give the president to keep things classified. Uh, it will go to the Supreme Court. Okay? Um, Nixon knows he'll probably lose in the Supreme Court, so he proposes a compromise. It's called the Stennis Compromise. Stennis was the name of a uh, politician at the time, and he said, hey, listen, I will play the tapes for Mr. Stennis. Mr. Stennis will write it down and we can all read the transcript. The reason he proposed that Stennis listen is because Stennis was 90% deaf. So he thought if that guy listened, he'd probably miss some stuff and he might be able to get away with it. Okay, uh, prosecutors did not fall for this. They rejected that compromise. Fast forward a couple of months. Okay, things are not going great for Nixon and he thinks he can end everything right now. Okay, at this point, he, there's no impeachment proceedings at this point. None of that's just looking into whether or not he covered up this thing, and it could get much worse if all the information gets out. So he decides to fire everybody. He orders the attorney general to fire the special prosecutor, the lawyer that was chosen to look into his misdeeds. The attorney general resigns, so the Nick or refuses. So the Nixon says, "Well, I'm going to fire you," and the attorney general says, "Whatever, I quit." So the attorney general's gone. So now who's in charge of all that stuff? Well, he has an assistant, the deputy attorney general. So Nixon tells the deputy attorney general to fire Archibald Cox, the special prosecutor. The deputy attorney general again refuses, and then he will resign as well when Nixon threatens to fire him. So now you go to the deputy deputy uh, uh, attorney general. Nixon tells that guy to fire uh, the special prosecutor, and that guy does, right? And he replaces the special prosecutor with somebody else. We call this the Saturday Night Massacre. So Nixon trying to fire everybody that was investigating him. The next morning, like I shouldn't say the next morning, Monday morning, the House begins impeachment proceedings against the president for obstructing justice. Um, so things get dramatically worse after this Saturday Night Massacre. So uh, on the left, there's a headline about it, but there's Archibald Cox and those uh, to the right are the two attorney generals that get or were threatened to get fired who end up uh, resigning their names were Richardson and Ruckelshaw. So you don't really need to know that, but that's who they were. Uh, Cox will get reinstalled as special prosecutor as well. So Saturday Night Massacre refers to what? Was it A, a major motion picture released in 1973? B, the firing of the special prosecutor and others during the Watergate investigation? C, Nixon's eventual resignation or D, none of the above? So, <clears throat> the Supreme Court, with all this stuff going on, the Supreme Court orders Nixon that he has to give up all of the tapes. And the tapes will absolutely, incredibly destroy Nixon. Not only do the tapes prove his guilt in the Watergate thing, but they also prove his guilt in a whole bunch of other weird things that he did and other ways that he was corrupt in office. Eventually, three articles of impeachment are decided upon, number one, abusing his power, number two, obstructing justice, and number three, contempt of Congress, so lying to or withholding information from Congress. Obvious that Nixon's going to get impeached. At this point, it's all over, and Nixon knows he's going to get impeached, so he resigns. Okay? He resigns on August 9th, 1974, the only president ever to resign. So, normally, if the president resigns, the vice president would take over. However, Spiro Agnew, his vice president, was also insanely corrupt and got caught literally accepting bribes in the vice presidential office and also got caught evading paying his own taxes. So he had to resign too. So the president's gone, the vice president's gone. So who becomes president? Gerald Ford. And why Gerald Ford? He was the Speaker of the House, and the Speaker of the House is second in line to be president through the 25th Amendment. So we call him the illegitimate president because he was never elected by the people to be president. He was elected to be a congressman from Michigan. And through all of his years of experience and blah, 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 whatever, the Republican Party named him as their chief representative in the Congress or the Speaker of the House because they had the most seats. So he becomes president through the 25th Amendment. 
So on the left, there is Gerald Ford. Okay, Nixon resigns, uh, urges a time of healing. Ford officially takes office. On the right, the final images of Nixon as president. He waves the double peace sign, and he gets on to Marine One, the presidential helicopter, and flies away. So who was the illegitimate president? Okay, the one president who has been our president without receiving any votes. Well, I guess I shouldn't say that. But at this point, receive zero votes because we have had some vice presidents take over. So, was it A, Nixon, B, Carter, C, Ford, or D, Reagan? Okay. So never voted on for executive office, we should say. All right, the aftermath of this, Ford will pardon Nixon, which is stupidly, stupidly, stupid. I've had arguments with all sorts of people. I mean, my parents grew up during all this, and they think that it was good that Ford pardoned Nixon. I think it's stupid. Um, Ford says our long national nightmare is over and we need to get over it. We don't need to look into anything. That's stupid. Uh, presidents aren't above the law. We gave Nixon the ultimate power of being president. And all he did with that ultimate power was lie to the American people, kill lots of innocent people, and abuse his power to remain in power. Uh, that's not okay. The fact that we pardon him just emboldened future presidents to do grossly illegal things, uh, including um, uh, President Reagan breaking numerous laws, uh, then a bunch of those people get pardoned under the Bush administration. Clinton did some really skeezy stuff, and we never looked into that. Uh, President Bush okayed torture and all sorts of other gross things. We never looked into that. Uh, President Obama uh, okayed more warrantless wiretaps and all sorts of other gross things. We never looked into that. Um, we need to hold them to a higher standard, is what I'm saying. I guess people were worried that one party would take over and be awful to the other party, but the parties are pretty awful to each other anyways, and we can't let presidents get away with stuff like this. Anyways. Ford pardons Nixon, and that's really bad for the Republicans. They lose the 76 four midterms and the 76 presidential elections because they're seen as corrupt. Uh, this will also heighten disrespect and distrust for the government. So there's another example of the government lying to us about stuff. A guy clearly broke the law, but he gets pardoned and doesn't have to go to jail, so people will trust the government even less. There will be some changes put in place, like some campaign finance rules get changed, and there are more watchdog groups uh, so there's some good news, some bad news here. Good news is the system worked. The Constitution survived. We followed the rules prescribed to us in our national uh, document. Bad news, like I said, it emboldens future presidents to be even more secretive uh, and hide the bad stuff that they did. And they all do bad stuff. Okay, uh, It's time for most Americans to grow up and, and understand that. right? And I want you to understand that from a very young age. All presidents do gross things. All right, so there's Ford pardoning Nixon. Uh, Ford will be a pretty uneventful president. We'll talk about him here in a minute uh, with my next lecture. Uh, but, pardon me. Great, great, great book about it, All the President's Men, which is the original reporting, and they wrote a second book called The Final Days. But say you don't want to read. On the right, Slow Burn is a podcast, and the slow burn on the Nixon uh, impeachment trials and the Watergate scandal is great. Great, great, great. There's also a great... Um, on Netflix, it's uh, through CNN. It's called The People vs. Richard Nixon. That is really, really good. We might do that as an activity. I don't know. We'll see if there's time and if you guys have access. But that's it for Nixon. I'll be back with a little bit of Ford and Carter.